So yeah, this time uh, we're talking about document level uh, models and document level models or models for long text are basically models that are intended to, um, uh, to make it possible to process beyond sentences. And there's a number of considerations that we need to think about in this case. Um, one consideration is efficiency because now we're throwing like a big uh, text into a single uh, model. And if it's too slow, then we aren't able, going to be able to process it well. Um, another issue is uh, whether we can learn the model in an appropriate way. And in order to learn the model in a, an appropriate way, we need to be creating things that work over much longer uh, links, uh, much longer spans. So you need kind of a stronger bias, I guess, uh, in the model to make sure that that can actually happen. Okay. Cool. Uh, so that was, um, that was slide number one. And I'll go to slide number two. Uh, so in slide number two, we talked about some of the uh, NLP tasks that we've handled so far. Uh, we've talked about things like language modeling, predicting the probability of a text. We've also talked about syntactic parsing and uh, classification and also entity tagging. So, uh, you know, parsing gets the structure of a sentence, classification uh, predicts a label for a sentence and entity tagging might uh, identify entities that appear in a, uh, in a sentence or something like this. And going to slide number three, all of these can be connected to tasks that we do over documents. And so if we talk about language modeling, we can do language modeling on the sentence by sentence level, but in fact, it is uh, as common or maybe even more common nowadays to do language modeling on the level of full documents. So there's also classification. So very often we do uh, single sentence classification, but we might also want to do document classification where we classify a whole document. Document classification can actually be easier than sentence classification a lot of the time uh, because we have more words. So like if we want to identify the topic of a document, it's often easier to do than identifying the topic of a sentence. However, um, if you need to find something very complicated uh, or complex, you might need to reason over, you know, lots of different places in the document appropriately and that could make it harder as well. Another task, which is not exactly, which doesn't exactly correspond to entity tagging on the sentence level, but is an important task if you want to consider entities on uh, a document level is entity co-reference. And what entity co-reference is, is it's basically uh, deciding which entities correspond to each other throughout a longer text. And I'll be talking about this in detail later, so I won't go into a lot of detail now. And another interesting task is something called discourse parsing. And like syntactic parsing or dependency parsing, which we talked about before, uh, you want to come up with some structure of a document. But in contrast to what we did before, uh, now we want to come up with the structure of um, the structure of correspondences between sentences in a document as opposed to the structure of correspondences between words in a text. I think they're ready. Yeah. Oh, no, we're just right. waiting. Right. Right. Kind of yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Great. So um, the next slide is slide number four. And uh, we're going to be talking about document level uh, language modeling and go to slide number five. OK. So document level language modeling, uh, we want to predict the probability of words in an entire document or predict the joint probability of an entire document. And obviously sentences in a document don't exist in vacuum. Uh, there's topical similarities. There's also discourse structure between the sentences. So we want to take advantage of that fact. And um, slide number five, uh, so, sorry, slide number six. Um, if we talk about uh, modeling using something like recurrent neural networks, um, recurrent neural networks, the way they worked was essentially by passing previous information 
uh, through the use of the hidden state. And so in a standard sentence level modeling task, the hidden state would basically record and memorize all of the information that we had um, in all of the previous words in the sentence. But if we go to uh, slide number seven, what we can see here is it's just as easy conceptually. There's no conceptual difference between passing the state from all of the words in the previous sentence or all of the words previous to this word in the sentence and all of the words previous to this in the document. So you could just append all of the words together into a single document and treat this as the thing that you want to be modeling. And you just throw it into an RNN and you hope the RNN is able to capture these dependencies. And in fact, this is something that people do and it, it works. Um, for an RNN, uh, for a recurrent neural network, this is actually linear time. So if you want to, uh, this works in linear time. So you would want to process a document of a thousand words. It would just be, you know, a uh, hundred times slower than processing a document uh, consisting of a hundred, uh, or sorry, a sentence of 10 words. So um, basically all you need to do is throw it into this and you can more or less uh, calculate an RNN. Um, however, one issue is that um, RNNs in particular, we talked about the vanishing gradient problem when we talked about them. And the vanishing gradient problem strikes RNNs particularly hard. So basically if you have a really, really long document, it doesn't know what information it should be referencing when it um, uh, makes these uh, decisions. Okay. Pause for a second, and <laughs> sounds like uh, sounds like things are working. Now, so let me just uh, point uh, Another thing that you can do is you can have separate uh, encoding methods for coarse grained uh, document context. And basically, the idea here is that instead of just assuming that something like an RNN can immediately capture all of the context that you would need all of the context that you would need uh, to model the following words. Um, you can have one kind of big RNN for local, um, you can have one uh, RNN for local context and another RNN for kind of more global context. And there's a number of different ways you can do this. Um, one obvious way to do this is just to have an RNN that reads in the last hidden state of every sentence and uh, updates the hidden state based on the last hidden state of every sentence and, for example, feeds that into uh, each word uh, that you are going to be predicting for the next sentence. So you have one RNN that's updated uh, less frequently, one RNN that's updated every word that you want to be outputting, for example. Um, so this, this is... Uh, what you would be doing in RNNs. Uh, now it's uh, more common, but not, you know, it's still, uh, you, people use RNNs uh, some of the time, but it's more common to use models like transformers in document level uh, language modeling tasks. And there's uh, a number of ways to do this as well. The simplest possible way to do this is to self attend to all of the previous words in the document. So you have an RNN, uh, a transformer based uh, model that you just input the whole document as a long string and feed it in. Uh, there's a couple of issues with this. Um, so th the advantage of this is this can relatively simply use document level context. Um, it can also learn interesting phenomena. Like for example, this uh, paper demonstrates uh, that you can learn uh, something that corresponds to co-reference, which is uh, what I'm going to be talking about later. Um, but one major issue with transformers like this is that compute computation is quadratic in the sequence length. So um, as you know, uh, transformers or any sort of attention model basically is calculating pairwise correspondences between each of the words in the sequence. 
And because it's computing a pairwise uh, correspondence between each of the words, obviously that's n squared computational complexity. So now when you start talking about, you know, like 5,000 word documents or something like this, like what a Wikipedia article would be, uh, that starts to become, you know, very costly. That's, you know, 25 million, 25 million computations of uh, dot products between vectors. So, um, yeah. So um, there's a bunch of different ways to solve this because this is actually a rather large problem now. Uh, the most simple way to solve this, uh, which is used in you know, many, many widely used models is just to not worry about sequences that are that long. Um, so things like uh, you know, GPT-3 or BART or all of these uh, common models that you use just say, okay, uh, we're limiting you to 512 tokens or we're limiting you to 1,024 tokens and you don't get to use anymore. Um, so that's one way to solve your problem. It's rather unsatisfying though, because you would like to you know, handle longer sequences than that if you want to do something creative like generating a Wikipedia article or something. So um, I'm gonna go through a number of examples of methods that have been used to mitigate this problem. Uh, the first one that I'll talk about is uh, Transformer XL. And Transformer XL is like a combination of truncated backpropagation through time and Transformer models. So if you remember all the way back to the RNN, uh, the RNN class, essentially what truncated backpropagation through time did was you would calculate all of the RNN states. Um, for a sequence. And then you would move on uh, to calculating the next sequence. Um, but instead of building one large computation graph and um, instead of adding one large computation graph and uh, backpropping all the way through it, you would throw out the old computation graph here and only keep uh, the final vector and feed it into the model here. So the reason why this is good is now you can consider an infinite context in the forward pass still, you know, you're still passing all the information from the previous, uh, from the previous sentences, uh, but you don't need to maintain it all in memory. So you can, um, you, it's basically more memory efficient. So what Transformer XL, and we, we covered this before, but what Transformer XL does is it's essentially the equivalent of this, uh, but for transformer-based models. And the idea is that you attend to uh, fixed vectors from the previous sentence. So in the standard transformer, uh, what you're doing is you basically have this limited context that you attend to. You always attend to, like, let's say your sequence length was four, you would always attend to these four sequences here. In Transformer XL, you attend to all of the vectors from the current sequence and you backprop into them, but you also attend to all of the vectors from the previous sequence and, um, and don't backprop into them. So you basically keep this around as a, uh, as a fixed uh, size vector. Um, and this is also implemented in models like XLNet, uh, which I think I talked about before in the pre-training uh, model. So this is a really nice, uh, simple, way to incorporate previous context. Can anyone, uh, can anyone take a guess at how much previous context this allows you to consider in a model? So an RNN with backpropagation through time allows you to consider infinite context because an RNN is passing along, is condensing infinite previous context into here. What about for this transformer model? And the answer is not infinite. Any ideas? Why not? Yeah, well, it's <laughs> that's a pretty big space of numbers, uh, finite. Yeah, any other ideas? As a hint, you can look at um, you can look at how far back any individual layer in the uh, in the model is able to look. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, to repeat, it's the number of layers times the length of the context. So basically this, this layer can look back um, all the way to here. Um, this layer can look back all the way to here. This layer can look back all the way to here. So if you had, um, if you had like 10 layers in your model and each um, context length was 512 tokens or 1024 tokens, you would be able to look back like 10,000 tokens, for example, um, into the past. Uh, so a thousand, a thousand token length and uh, 10 layers would allow you to look back uh, 10,000, for example. Um, so that allows you to, uh, you know, expand the length that you're looking at pretty, uh, pretty far. This is also like a truncated back property time for RNNs, basically because you're calculating this, but throwing away your computation graph. Um, yeah. Any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, if you shifted the attention one layer up on the, on the context, on the context side. Yeah, so we also focus on, we don't focus on the input, the X, uh, X is below. We actually focus on the transform browser. Um, actually, I think that would probably only, let's see. That's a good question. Yeah, I, th I think that's right, actually. Yeah, well, yeah, why don't you try it out and see what happens? <laughs> it's a good, that's a good point. Um, I think the like one issue with doing that would be that if there's a significant difference in the semantics, um, if there's a different significant difference in the semantics between the things in this layer and this layer, then you would need to have a model that was able to attend to like things, uh, outputs from this layer and outputs from this layer simultaneously, or you need some tricky way to handle it. But, um, uh, but yeah, that's a good question. And for the people on Zoom um, or in the back of the room and who weren't able to hear, one question was, uh, couldn't you attend to the previous outputs from the same layer? And then that would allow you to have a longer span of things you attend to, which I think is, is actually uh, the case. It's a nice idea. Cool. Um, so another, uh, another method that people have proposed is something called the compressive transformer. And the compressive transformer is a little bit like uh, the thing I talked about before, where you have a the thing I talked about before, where you have a, a multi-scale RNN. So in the multi-scale in the multi-scale RNN, basically uh, you would have one RNN that reads in the last uh, state of every sentence, um, and uh, kind of works on a, a longer scale, and then you have another RNN that works on a more fine-grained scale. Um, the compressive transformer, what it does is you have the sequence that you're actually processing now, you have a memory. Um, so these are kind of like the more recent things uh, analogous to what we were talking about in transformer XL. Um, and then they also have a compression function that compresses um, the outputs here into uh, memory. Uh, so it takes in like three vectors and compresses them into a single vector. Could be something as simple as just like averaging things together, but in reality, they, they use a function that's a little bit more uh, complex than that. And the idea behind this is basically if you compress, um, you know, lots of vectors into a single vector, this allows you to uh, maintain, you know, high level context about the topic or something like that in the compressed memory here. Um, while still maintaining, uh, you know, reasonable computational complexity. Cool. 
So another option that people have looked at are uh, sparse transformers. And basically sparse transformers, um, there's lots of different varieties of these. Um, but the basic idea is that you want to be doing attention to not all of the previous context, but some of the tokens in the previous context. And there's different ways uh, that you can do this. Oops. There's different ways that you can do this. Uh, like one way that you could do this is attend to the previous four words and then attend to every four words, um, every four words here. Uh, so like if we look at the, the last word in the sequence, it would be attending to the previous three words and then the fourth word, the eighth word, the 12th word, uh, et cetera. And because of this, you know, if you have an efficient uh, GPU-based implementation of this, you know, you could at least theoretically uh, save four times the uh, four times the compute here. One other way you can think of this is this is almost exactly the same as compressive transformer, where your compression function here is just taking the last vector. So. Uh, you can think of essentially the sparse, uh, this sparse transformer here is a compressive transformer with like a, a specific compression function. Uh, there's also a, um, a fixed version of the sparse transformer. And basically what this does is instead of uh, like moving this along every word, it splits the input into blocks and it's always attending to the uh, like the end of the block. So that's another way to do it. Um, both of them uh, are similar in performance, but they, uh, you know, this one might be a little bit easier to implement, for example. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very nice job of anticipating my next slide. So <laughs> that's, uh, how, how can we learn the sparsity as a question? So that, that's what I'm gonna be talking about just next. So um, there's also adaptive uh, span transformers. Um, actually, sorry, this is, not, this is not the slide I was talking about. The slide I was talking about is going to be the next one. So um, another interesting finding is that you can uh, make the span, um, a, you can uh, use a span adaptive attention head by making the attention head of uh, some, heads uh, have a, a shorter span, basically be only attending to the most recent context. And attention heads of uh, other, and other attention heads giving them a longer span. And basically what you do is you add a little bit of, um, you add a little bit of regularization to try to encourage the model to not look at longer contexts when it doesn't need to. And if you do something like this, interestingly, the model learn, uh, can learn patterns that look a little bit like this. So basically in the early spans, it barely attends beyond kind of like the minimum limit that it's allowed to attend to. And then for uh, the, the higher layers, it starts attending to much longer uh, distances on some of the attention heads. So basically some of the attention heads are trained to look really far back into the context. And other attention heads uh, look at more uh, look at more local context. Um, this can also further be uh, combined with uh, sparse computation. So basically, it um, it not only has adaptive spans, but it also um, learns uh, where things should be sparse. And basically, the way you do this is uh, by using a sparse version of attention, uh, where if you have a score under a certain uh, amount, it basically gets cut off to zero. And there's uh, functions like the sparse max, sparse max function that are kind of like sparse versions of the soft max uh, that allow you to do something like this. So one really um, nice, I guess interesting implementation of this is something called the reformer. Um, I kind of view this as a really a really good 
job of solving a lot of the engineering problems that you have to be solving in order to make this actually work. Um, and the big problem is that there's a chicken and egg problem in sparse attention, especially adaptively sparse attention, where you're trying to uh, choose uh, which things you should be attending to. And the problem is that you can sparsify relatively low scoring values to improve efficiency, but what are the low scoring values? In order to know what the low scoring values are, you need to be sparsifying, you need to be calculating them so that like uh, that ruins the, uh, the value of sparsifying them in the first place. So basically what reformer is, is it's efficient calculation of the sparse attention and the way it works is basically uh, threefold. They share the key and query parameters. So normally you have, um, uh, you know, in the transformer model, you have the key, uh, the query, and the value. Um, they share these two parameters together to try to um, make sure that the key and the query, which are the two things that you need to uh, be using to um, to calculate the attention our value are in the same space. Um, and then they use a method called locality sensitive hashing to efficiently calculate high scoring uh, attention weights. And what locality sensitive hashing does is essentially it is, um, I haven't talked about this yet here, have I? No. It's a useful technique to know for like lots of different things, but um, I always uh, don't know when the best time to talk about it is. But like, let's say we have all of these points in a space. I'm doing a two dimensional space here, but it could be any, any dimension of space. And basically what you do is you have a whole bunch of uh, potentially random, uh, planes in this space. And you uh, divide them into things that are on one side of the plane or the other side of the plane. And for each point, if we call this uh, plane number one, plane number two, and plane number three, uh, and we look at a particular point, then, um, oops. And we look at a particular point here. This point is on the correct side of plane number one and the like wrong side of plane number two. So that gives it a value of one zero zero. Um, and now that means that we can put it in the one zero zero bucket. And because we put it in the one zero zero bucket, it's also in the bucket with all of the other points that are like relatively close to it because they're also on the same side of each of the planes here. So. Um, that's what locality sensitive caching allows you to do. And then you can do other things like find ones that are only one bucket away or only one bit away like here as well. Yes. What's a reasonable way to initialize the planes? Good question. Um, randomly is maybe the most common. So um, in a very high dimensional space, if you initialize planes randomly, then they're very likely to be in kind of orthogonal directions. So um, that's, uh, that's often sufficient if you're interested in uh, creating this, yeah. So the more, the more planes you have, the more fine-grained your division is going to be. Um, so, and computation, computation will increase, but your locality judgments are going to be better, basically. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, in the same direction, what is the point that's really far away from the origin? So, uh, they're actually not close to each other in comparison to some other points, but still they're in the same model. Um, so, what if there's something that that's very possible to happen in a method like locality sensitive caching. There's other methods like building uh, tree structures. Um, another thing is like once you get all the things in the same bucket, you can recalculate the distance between them. So once you've ruled it down to a much smaller number, you can recalculate the distance between them. So there's lots of tricks that you can do for approximate, you know, like nearest neighbor search. Um, here they're 
if I remember correctly, they're using basically the simplest possible thing you can do, which is just locality sensitive caching and putting things in the same bucket. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. So locality sensitive caching, basically what this allows you to do is it allows you in sublinear time to find very similar, uh, find very similar things. So um, if you want to find all of the things that are in the same bucket, all of the points that are in the same bucket, um, this LSH bucketing will allow you to do this. So you have the, um, uh, all of the blue ones, all of the yellow ones, all of the red ones, all of the white ones, and these are more likely to be close together. So then what you do uh, to calculate attention is you calculate attention among all of the blue ones. And then you assume that the attention between all of the non-blue ones is zero, essentially. Um, and that allows, you to, uh, that allows you to efficiently calculate attention between the things that probably will get back attention score. So this is obviously an approximation. It's, it's wrong, but it's uh, you know, good enough. Okay. And then there's also one more trick. Um, this is actually, I think, less important, but basically um, to make this work efficiently on GPUs, instead of calculating within the buckets, they calculate within chunks over the sorted buckets, but that's not super important to know uh, in order to understand the basic idea. Cool, so I, I think like, I'm very glad that somebody else implemented this because <laughs> it's really complicated. I think it's like the right way to do things, the right way to do sparse attention, but it's complicated and, you know, uh, like uh, you probably wouldn't want to be implementing this yourself uh, unless, you, unless you like uh, like algorithms in this sense. Cool. So then taking a completely different tack is um, some very interesting methods uh, that correspond to a uh, low rank approximation of the attention matrix. And the idea here is basically that calculating the attention matrix is expensive. And um, so in order to do this, you can try to calculate it with an approximation that is uh, low rank. And there's a couple of ways to do this, um, uh, like the Linformer, which is adding low rank linear projections in, into the model. And also a Nystrom former, which is approximating using the Nystrom method, which has to do with sampling landmark points. But basically um, the basic idea behind both of these is that we have the actual attention matrix that we would want to be calculating. Um, and what we do is instead we approximate it using a, um, a low rank matrix here, a low rank square matrix here, and then a, um, a bigger matrix here. And the ways to project the higher dimension things into these lower dimensional values are essentially learned uh, together with the model. So um, there's also, uh, yeah, so uh, I think these are uh, interesting. And for the details, you can go in and look at the paper. But the idea is basically that um, you know we have a big matrix that we would like to calculate, but it's too expensive. So we do it, um, we do it in this way. Great. So then there's a next question of how we can evaluate document level models. Um, for language models in particular, one way to do so is with perplexity and classification over long documents. Um, however, there is an issue uh, with this, which is that perplexity, the, the types of words that require long document context to solve correctly are not super frequent. And because they're not very frequent, that also means that they won't have a major contribution to perplexity. And so there were a couple um, experiences recently, a couple of papers recently that basically showed that some of these longer document models actually were not seriously using long document context and rather 
they were also better model. They were reported to be better than models that didn't use long vacuum in context. But if you evaluated them on short sentences, they were also better. So what this means is essentially, it's not super clear that the long document context is the thing that is contributing, uh, but rather it's just that it's a better model overall for whatever reason, maybe you're adding some noise into the training process through uh, the like noise added by doing LSH bucketing or something like that. And that's giving you like an analog to drop out or something like this. Uh, so because of this, um, just evaluating over document level language modeling and saying your perplexity is better might be a bit of a noisy signal about whether it's actually using document level context. So because of this, there's also more focused methods. Um, like, for example, can you uh, put scrambled sentences back into the correct order in the document? So you scramble all the sentences in the document and you try to score them uh, by putting them back in order. Um, another thing is you can curate individual uh, training sets that basically uh, have, according to the human eye anyway, uh, final sentences that you would need to understand the whole story or the whole document in order to predict them well. Um, an another example of this is a final word prediction. So basically they, they have a word with a couple of distractor words and they try to very carefully handcraft the words in order to make sure that this uh, um, works properly. Um, there's also composite benchmarks containing several tasks like the long range arena. Um, this is not just language tasks. There's also other tasks like pixel by pixel prediction of, um, uh, of images and stuff like this, but there's also uh, things here. Um, I, I think one for final word prediction, also I can, um, there, there's kind of a higher level idea of contrastive evaluation, where instead of just trying to predict the probability of an individual word, you try to predict the probability of um, distinguishing between two, two words, essentially. Um, and you know, maybe that word is uh, something like hockey and baseball. Uh, which are like highly confusable, and you think that the evidence to tell you which is which is somewhere early in the document or something. So um, unfortunately, this is a little bit hard to devise these in a way that there's no other predictors like nearby. So uh, this is a challenge, but I think overall evaluating document level models is pretty hard. Um, I, I don't know if there's any like silver bullet that, that is a good way of doing it always. Um, yeah. Any any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't. So I can actually point you to the exact paper that I was talking about. It's not generally. It's not generally true. Um, it's just. So yeah, actually, I I should have I should have put this on my slides, but I I saw the paper after I after I made the slides, so um, it was kind of too late for that. But like this is one example uh, where they have uh, do long range models they actually use long range context and. Um, they evaluate a model called the routing transformer. It's kind of a, one of the dynamic uh, dynamic attention um, models. And uh, they demonstrate that, you know, it's still performing well, even when you don't give it a uh, sentence level context. So uh, even when the prefix is, is short, it's performing like almost equally well, right? So um, I, I think, uh, I, I think that's uh, an interesting uh, interesting finding indicating that it's not necessarily the long context, but it might just be the training strategy or something like that. So this would be one example. There's other examples as well in the literature, but this, this would be a good place. So. Cool, any, any other questions? Okay.
So um, in the remainder of the time, I want to talk a little bit about um, some document level tasks that we haven't really talked about very much before. Um, the first one is entity co-reference. This is, in my mind, one of the most underestimated tasks in NLP with respect to how important it is if you want to do anything useful with NLP. Because um, like, let's say you want to be uh, extracting information about uh, whether people liked a particular um, event or not, or product or not. Like, let's say you work at a company uh, where you're trying to give an assessment of like whether customers like a product. Most of the time, they're not going to be saying, "I liked, I liked my new Samsung Galaxy." They're going to be saying. Um, I bought a new Samsung Galaxy. Uh, it's working pretty well, but uh, the screen is a bit small. And you'll you'll note that I said it's working pretty well, right? So you need to um, understand that it refers to the Samsung Galaxy. So this just happens everywhere in NLP when you try to do anything uh, useful. So this is. Um, the basic idea of uh, entity go reference is identifying noun phrases mentioning an entity. Um, note that this is different than named entity recognition because in named entity recognition, you'd be recognizing things like Queen Elizabeth or King George VI, whereas identifying entity mentions is identifying things like her and husband and other things like this. So this is a harder task than uh, just named entity recognition. Then the second thing is clustering noun phrases referring to the same underlying world entity. So any of the mentions, you want to turn them into entity clusters. So mention detection uh, looks a little bit like this. Um, so here we have a renowned speech therapist was summoned to help the king overcome his speech impediment. Um, we could have a renowned speech therapist or we could have a renowned speech, right? And so which one is the one that we should be considering as an entity mention? Um, so detecting the relevant round noun phrases is a difficult and important step and uh, knowing the correct noun phrases affects the result a lot. So if you're given you know, gold standard noun phrases, your accuracy is much, much higher than if you're not. Um, Often this is done as a pre-processing step. Actually, I wrote normally here uh, when we created the slides a couple of years ago. Now I think actually end-to-end -end co-reference is, uh, is more common. So it's not necessarily done as uh, pre -process. So the components of a co-ref model are, um, we need to know the instances that we are, uh, that we're parsing, uh, so that we're considering. We need to design features for them and we need to optimize towards uh, evaluation metrics. And we need a search algorithm over structure. So in a way, this is a lot like um, something like dependency parsing or, uh, yeah, it's a lot like dependency parsing because essentially we're trying to find um, relations between entities and the subjects. So uh, we face similar problems that we face today. So in terms of the instances, uh, you can form co-reference as a structured prediction problem. Um, there's an exponential number of possible clusters. So it's basically the number of partitions of noun phrases in the sentence, uh, in the document. And models are designed to explore this space. Um, and there's mention-based strategies, entity-based strategies. Um, and uh, cluster-based strategies. Um, but mention-based strategies basically try to classify the difference between each mention. And if we think back to dependency parsing, these are often trained a lot like the graph-based dependency parsers where we calculate the coherence between each mention and, uh, and try to maximize the graph over those. Um, Entity-based strategies are often trained a little bit more like shift-reduce parsers. Um, or incremental uh, parsers, dependency parsers, where uh, you make incremental judgments and start clustering things together one at a time. Um, the reason why you might want to use an entity-based strategy as opposed to a mention-based strategy is if we look at Bill Clinton here, and we want to know which mention this should link to, if we know that this Clinton 
is mapped to Hillary Clinton and she, it becomes pretty obvious that we shouldn't be mapping Bill Clinton to this mention. However, if we don't know that Clinton is part of this cluster a priori, then that makes it actually quite difficult, right? So um, Clinton might uh, map to Bill Clinton. So mentioned pair models are the simplest uh, variety. They basically classify a co-reference relation between every two mentions. And so uh, we have Queen Elizabeth and her, Queen Elizabeth and husband, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple, uh, these are simple, which is an advantage obviously, but there's also some drawbacks. So um, for example, they may re uh, result in uh, conflicts and transitivities. So you might, say uh, that Queen Elizabeth and her are a pair, um, Queen, El Queen Elizabeth and a viable mar monarch are a pair, but a viable monarch and her are not a pair, for example. So then what do you do in that case? Um, another issue is that there's too many negative training instances. So if you have like a thousand mentions in the document, uh, now you have a million training instances and most of them are negative, that makes training a little bit difficult. And they don't capture the entity or cluster level features, like I mentioned before. So entity mentioned models are uh, where you basically create an instance between a mentioned and, and a previous cluster. Um, and you extract cluster level features for the entire cluster. Um, for example, uh, are the genders of the cluster all, all compatible? Is the cluster containing only pronouns? That's a little bit strange, right? Because, you know, um, usually a pronoun refers to something. Are uh, most of the entities the same gender? What are the sizes of the clusters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, recently, uh, actually co-reference is another one of the tasks that actually was really hard. This was a task that was totally unsolved before neural network models came around. And now it's much closer to being, I wouldn't say solved, but like performing at a usable level. Um, and the advantage is that you can learn features uh, with embeddings since most of them can be captured by surface features. Um, it also makes it easier to train towards uh, the metric using reinforcement learning or margin-based methods. I'm not gonna be talking about these that much because we're going to be talking about these methods uh, next time on Tuesday. Uh, but basically you can directly optimize evaluation metrics. Um, and you can also jointly perform mention detection and clustering. And this was also another big win for neural network based models. So a typical model of this is um, uh, this end-to-end -end neural co-reference model. And basically the way that it works is um, we represent all the features with a neural network and we allow the use the neural network and allow it to allow errors to flow end to end all the way back to mention detection. Um, so this also solves uh, span errors, which were not handled well by pipeline models. So the way it works essentially is the first thing you do is you have some neural feature extractor. This says bidirectional LSTM, but that's actually not important at all. It can be bird, it can be anything else. Um, and then you have a way to take the features that you calculate over each, um, over each span and convert them into a span level feature. The specific way uh, that they did it here was they took the first one and the last one and the sum of all of the features and then they used that as the span representation. And then given the span representation, you have a prediction of a mention score. And the mention score tells you how likely this is to be a mention, essentially. Um, so this is the first step. This is the, the span, the mention detection uh, pipeline. Then once you have done this sort of mention detection part, um, the first thing that you do is you prune out all of the things that have a very low mention score. And, oops. So one of the problems with uh, co-reference is that if you have a really long document and let's say you consider all spans of up to length five as potential co-reference, now it's not just a problem of having quadratic complexity, 
Um, it's the problem of having quadratic complexity times the length of the spans you're considering. So it's even worse than you know the problems we talked about before with attention. So uh, what this model does is it basically prunes out all spans with a low enough mention score that they're not worth considering. So you get a much smaller number of uh, a much smaller number of spans that you you would be uh, wanting to consider. And then once you do this, you uh, calculate both. Uh, you calculate a score for the co-reference based on each individual mentioned score, and um, a score calculated from the pairs of the span representations here. And one really nice thing about this is because you are directly using this mentioned score in the calculation of this score here, you can now backprop all the way into the mentioned detection as well, because you backprop into this score here, uh, which backprops into the mention, um, which backprops into the mention uh, detection score, uh, which backprops all the way into the, you know, the representation. Cool. So I, I think this is a, a really uh, wonderful model. Um, I actually didn't put this on the, on the slide, but I like it so much that we kind of generalized this. Um, into a model that can um, handle a quite large number of NLP tasks. So it can handle things like uh, named entity reference, uh, relation extraction, part of speech tagging. And the basic idea is that um, all of these tasks, named entity recognition, constituency parsing, part of speech tagging, aspect-based sentiment analysis, relation extraction, co-ref, Semantic role labeling, open IE, dependency parsing, and uh, this was re relation labeling, I guess, um, can be formed as uh, identifying spans and calculating relationships between spans. And so, you, of course, the model that I just talked about here um, allows you to do that by identifying the, men the spans here and uh, calculating a relationship between them. So uh, this model uh, itself can be used far more widely beyond, uh, beyond just the co-reference task. So I think it's a, a very nice uh, thing. Cool. Um, any questions about that? Um, this is just trained for the final co-reference test, and the mention ranking loss is uh, basically part of the loss that goes into deciding the entity mention. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So um, co-reference co is uh, super useful uh, as a tool in like a rule-based NLP system where you're basically doing co-reference and then you're identifying, um, you know, things like sentiment about a particular uh, about a particular entity or something like that. So um, I think that's the most widely used application of co-reference. Um, however, uh, it can also be used in neural models, and there are things like uh, co-reference aware language models where basically um, the co-reference aware language models um, accumulate information about co-referent entities um, and use that information about the co-referent entities to pass information along longer document contexts. Um, there's also co-reference aware QA models where basically the encoding, um, the encoding between the elements of the document is supervised uh, based on whether two elements are co-referent here. So you could view this as a way of like supervising attention in a, in a language model or something like this. Um, I, I think these are very nice models, but you can also, um, there's also a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here, which is that co-reference would be super useful if it worked all the time, but co-reference tends to fail when the QA model tends to fail also. So. Um, you need to have a co-reference model that is essentially strong enough 
to be useful uh, when the QA model is failing due to these, uh, these issues. So because of that, I'd say co-reference is an interesting thing to incorporate in these models, but it's most useful when you're, um, when you're using it to like resolve entities for uh, like a rule-based processing system or something like that. Cool. Um, any questions or move on? Okay, great. Oh, I, I see a question. Um, could conditioning on a KB, could a conditioning on a knowledge base for co-reference be helpful since we talked about uh, relations between entities in the past class? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. And I definitely think uh, that conditioning on a knowledge base could be helpful here. Uh, maybe by improving the representations of the spans through uh, information that's included in the knowledge base. Sure, you know, if you know, um, if you know that somebody is a politician or a professor, it's going to be much more likely that that coordinates with, you know, a mention of a politician or uh, the president or something like that, if you have that information. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Cool. So the last part is discourse parsing. And what discourse parsing is, is basically uh, this. So um, we have a, um, a parse of a whole document uh, that looks a little bit like this. So we have Mars, which is the title of the document. Um, and then we have something like with its distance, distant orbit, 50% uh, farther from the sun than the earth and a slim atmospheric blanket. So this is background. background. And then we have Mars experiences frigid weather conditions. So basically, Mars experiences frigid weather conditions, and this is the reason why it does. Uh, we have other things like list. Uh, so surface temperatures typically average about 60 degrees Celsius and can dip to minus 123 Celsius during near the poles. So this is kind of like listing up information. We have other things like contrast. Actually, I'm not sure why this isn't contrast, but um, uh, yeah, we have contrast here. So only the midday sun at tropical latitudes is warm enough to thaw the ice on occasion, uh, but any liquid water formed in this way would evaporate almost instantly because of the low atmospheric pressure. Um, so it's a contrast between two things. Yeah. My favorite thing about this example is that it's actually kind of wrong now. It actually sounds like what I said. Okay. <laughs> I, so I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, but this example is like wrong, <laughs> I guess. This is from um, uh, Marku in 2000. So uh, the fact that uh, it's wrong, it has been invalidated by 2021. This maybe yeah. not so. I should update my example is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so this is, um, this is useful because like, for example, uh, let's say you, let's say you have a QA system or an interactive question answering system or something like that, um, you might find a statement and then you might want to know what the evidence for that statement is. So if you had a discourse parser, that would essentially tell you that immediately. Um, of course, you could create a big data set of like questions and evidence uh, or backup for that question or Altern alternative opinions or something like that. But at the same time, you know, if you had a parser that told you about these, um, uh, these relationships, then uh, that would, you'd be able to do it without building a big training data set. So, um, so there's lots of models to do this. Um, one interesting thing about this model is it's kind of a recursive model that steps up the, uh, the structure tree here. Um, there's also models that, do classification between the spans by calculating span representations and things like this. Um, the actual details of the model are uh, probably less important than knowing that this is something that you can do. Um, but I, I think one other interesting thing to note is, you know, you could use this in a rule-based system where you want to do things like extract evidence. Um, you could also use it in neural models. Um, so, you can uh, do things like discourse structured uh, classification of text uh, based on um, a recursive neural network structure. 
but um, I, I think the interesting thing here is basically what they did was they, um, they gave some supervision into the model that said that these particular types of statements are more important. So like types of statements that are near the top of the discourse tree are more important. Types of statements that are of a particular variety are more important with respect to text classification. And um, discourse parsing is another task that's relatively hard uh, to, to solve well. And uh, one interesting thing here was this was an example in this paper, they had examples where uh, the improvement in discourse parsing accuracy was very well correlated with how much their model helped. So I, I like the experiments in this paper a lot uh, because it was showing that, you know, if you're doing better parsing, you'll probably be getting better classification like this as well. Cool. So yeah, that's all I uh, all I have for today. Are there any uh, questions about long documents or uh, parsing them or things like that? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, I guess we can finish up. Thanks a lot.